And we are live. Welcome back to today's episode of MicroConf On Air. I'm your host, Rob Walling. As you know, every Wednesday we live stream for about 30 minutes and we talk about topics related to building and growing ambitious SaaS startups that don't require us to work 80 hour weeks or raise crazy amounts of venture capital. We frankly, burn ourselves or our relationships out. And we want to be ambitious, but you know, we don't want to burn the candle at both ends and wind up uh, kind of living an unhappy life. We have a long-term mindset, so we think in terms of years and not months, and we seek freedom, purpose, and relationships. Thank you so much for joining me on the live stream again today. As a reminder, if you miss any of these live streams, they are available asynchronously on, uh, that's like the worst marketing word ever. They're available on a podcast feed called MicroConf On Air. You can search that in any podcatcher, or you can just type in microconfpodcast.com. And every Thursday morning, you will hear this show appearing there. Today, we got a good topic. Its title is Finding Product Market Fit in a Competitive Space. And my guest today is Mr. Derek Reimer. You've probably heard of him. He's the co-founder of Drip. He is, uh, someone just pointed out nice tie, Rob. So I dressed up for the show today. I don't normally wear a tie. Completely coincidental, actually, that I, I grabbed this shirt to happen to match something else I was wearing. So um, Derek and I started Drip together back in the day. Um, I met him when he was, I think he was like 22, 23 years old in Fresno. And he was a, a savvy programmer and had taught himself design as well. And we started collaborating on a few things. And um, he was the fir- wrote the first lines of code on Drip way back in 2012. So co-founder of Drip, he is the founder of Savvy Cal, which is a calendaring, calendaring and scheduling app that we'll be talking about today as he's entering this, you know, this competitive space. And he is the co-host of the Art of Product podcast. Uh, if you're not checking that out, you can hear he, him and Ben Ornstein, co-founder of Tuple, talk through their struggles, victories, and failures every week on the Art of Product. So if you're interested in uh, finding out more, SavvyCal.com, S-A-V-V-Y Cal. And that is, as I said, it's scheduling. Um, Derek is entering a pretty crowded space and looking to uh, innovate in there and compete with a lot of you know incumbents. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you have questions for Derek or myself, please, microconfconnect.com, or if you're probably already in Microconf Connect, go into the Microconf On Air channel and... Um, type in a question. That's the beauty of doing this format live and not just having Derek and I record a podcast, which we've done many times, is that you're able to interact and ask questions live. So with that, I'd love to uh, welcome my friend Derek Reimer to the show, man. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. And yeah. um, you should have given me the memo about wearing the drip shirts, man. I could have brought my we could have We could have matched. I hadn't even I think of that. We, I got to do that. There's very few guests that I share a shirt with. <laughs> I bet we have like four different, because you have. I still have the level shirt that you gave me yep. level rest yep. in peace and we have multiple drip shirts in yeah in common so cool man thanks for coming on the show today yeah thanks for having me yeah so we're going to talk about um savvy cal which you know it competes with uh, calendly and schedule well what's the other one called what's the big one the big two calendar apps yeah, Con- you can book me uh, yeah you can QA. book me yeah. Acuity is uh, one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. But it, it's a big space. There's there's many players and there's many big players. I mean, Calendly is a massive, yep. massive org. So I think to kick us off, it's, you know, why you, you had a choice to enter any space. You know, after we exited Drip, you could <laughs> kind of do whatever you wanted. And you entered a, you know, entered, entered a space as competitive as calendaring. So why enter such a crowded market? Yeah. So I've had, I mean, kind of a, a decently long journey that we'll probably touch on. Well, it feels like a long time since leaving Drip of, uh, of trying a bunch of different things, but, you know, ultimately kind of landed on this, this current playbook of the competitive space, because I mean, it really comes down to the fact that like, there's a lot of, um, like a lot of competition in a space tends to correlate with a really large active market. And, um, you know, that's something that I think a lot of bootstrappers kind of, uh, don't necessarily like fear, um, entering into, you know, a lot of us kind of tend to look for, you know, kind of niche opportunities that maybe is not on anybody's radar and there's not a lot of competition, but I think, um, that often leads to, you know, um, crickets, like launching something and no one really caring about it. So to me, like, like 
the competitive space is just an indicator that that there's there's a lot of opportunity here and um you know there's a, a broad range of different users of these kinds of tools and so one thing i recognize when i was kind of vetting different spaces to go into is that um you know a lot of the tools are extremely broadly positioned and th so they're kind of general purpose and a lot of times that's a sign that like they're maybe not serving the needs of every particular sub niche within the market um, super well. And, and there's a lot of incumbents who have been around for a number of years. And as we learned from our drip experience with, with the likes of Infusionsoft and, and players like that, they tend to calcify over time a bit. And, um, you know, anyone who's run a, an app for a number of years knows that you start to get kind of bound by legacy and, and that, does inhibit your ability to move quickly to you know listen to like a, a, a particular niche of customers that you have and their pain points because now you're trying to you know build a product that satisfies the needs of everybody in your market so i think that you know presents a lot of opportunity for kind of a, a scrappy newcomer to um to hone in on a particular set of um set of pain points people have yeah, there, you, you touched on a couple things there. I, I mean, I think I want to start with, you know, if, if we go back to my book, Start Small, Stay Small, written in 2010, it talks a lot about entering these really small niches and staying away from big competitive spaces. Because if you're an individual bootstrapper, especially if you're early, I mean, this is pre-stair-stepping. I hadn't talked about it yet, yeah. but that would fit well into that book. But, uh, you know, are there niches where you can build a two, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month business that are really small and not very competitive? Yes, absolutely there are. Mm -hmm. Your goals are different than that. You have been there, done yeah. that. You've had, uh, with CodeTree, you had a low six-figure exit. With Drip, obviously a much, much larger exit than, than that, that, you know, that, that we took part in. And you want to build a seven or eight figure business, a multi-million or decamillion, you know, ARR business. And so I, I do want, I feel like people give advice of like, you should always enter these massive competitive spaces. It's like, no, 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 Especially if you're early right. in your journey. If I was an indie hacker, we my first product, I would either stair step it and do little, you know, little products, or I would find just a tiny, tiny little SaaS niche that I can build up to five or 10K a month. I mean, that's what, that's what I did, you know? And mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a sense, you did that with CodeTree as well, right? It, it was doing... Yeah single digit thousands a month. And it was a great little add on to, um, to GitHub, you know, to GitHub issues or to GitHub, I guess. And yep. that, that's a, that's a perfectly viable way, especially if you're early at a different stage, you know, it, it becomes where you are ready to seven, eight, nine figure business. Well, yeah. Are there any spaces today that, that you can build a seven, eight, nine figure business that don't have competition in SaaS? I, I don't believe there are. There were in 2005 and there were some in 2010 and just each year, I think those have been whittled away, you know? So yeah. if you do want to build that large business, it's something you're going to have to do, I think. Yeah. And especially like, I mean, a lot of people feel the temptation to like try to create their own category or something, you know, like, like build yeah. something completely novel. And, and maybe, you know, if you were pitching to a venture capitalist who wanted to put a bunch of, you know, high risk capital after this idea that may completely flame out, you know, that's one route to go, but it's not particularly feasible for, for bootstrappers who are trying to get to default alive quickly and, and build sustainable businesses. Right. Yeah. And yeah, that's right. And I, I think there's, there's kind of two ways to build a large, let's say seven, eight, nine figure SaaS business today, right? You can go into a competitive space and you can just, uh, innov out innovate them like drip did yeah. to Infusionsoft, or you can niche down like you're doing, which is like, maybe, maybe you out innovate Calendly, but maybe you just build the best, you know, calendar app for executives or founders or salespeople or, you know, mm -hmm. some niche that's not currently being served really well. Um, or I think you can catch a, a new area, like a new technology or a new, you know, I think of Josh with bare metrics, right? He was just early yeah. cause the Stripe ecosystem was early and he was the first analytics um, piece. And that actually leads us to, uh, let's see, I had another question, although, you know, there's so many questions coming in from listeners. I think I'm going to bail on my next question and just <laughs> ask this. It's a little bit of a non sequitur, but um, it's from Josh Manders. And he said, why did you switch from Mighty Cal to Savvy Cal? I really liked the name Mighty Cal. <laughs> yeah, that was, um, that was a fun week dealing with that, uh, <laughs> that issue. So basically you liked the, the name Mighty Cal too. I did like the name Mighty Cal. Um, it was quite mighty. Um, so ultimately, it it bears somewhat uncomfortable similarity to another um, 
SaaS product. And so I kind of consulted with um, an IP lawyer or a trademark lawyer um, to see like, to, to suss out the risk of forging ahead with this name versus picking something that's a little bit cleaner in, in respect to trademark. And ultimately he um, spent a couple hundred dollars on that. He gave me kind of a, a nice rundown of like eight different bullet points around you know, defensibility of trademarks and basically said, in my professional opinion, probably best to change it now. And if there's ever a good time to change it, it's now before you're launched. So thus new name. Such a bomber, man. Trademark law, that stuff. It's good you did it early. There is an interesting question from Cam Sloan uh, that just came in that actually ties into what I was going to say right before Josh Manders, which is I was talking about ways that you can build a large business, right? And you can go into an existing space and compete, or you can try to catch a wave and be early to a space. And that was something that you were that you tried with Static Kit, which was the app yeah. prior to this. And you're you're entering the static website um, space in essence and building yeah. a tool there. And yep. so that is another way that you know people can keep in mind. There's a lot of risk there that a the space never takes off, or b your right. tool you know doesn't wind up being needed in the space. I mean, there's all types of stuff there. But Cam's question is, how would you distinguish between entering the forms market, i.e., Static Kit, and the calendar booking space? What drove you away from the former? Yeah. So the the forms space, um, like my ambitions with Static Kit were always a little bit larger than just kind of form backend as a service. Um, there's in that particular, like very small, um, narrow range of functionality. There are a ton of different, a ton of competitors too in that area. But the difference between kind of calendaring and forms is that, um, they're, it's sort of a race to the bottom with the, with the forms piece. So, you know, um, so it was kind of hard to get the economics right on, on, pricing and and delivering sufficient value to kind of build a, a compelling business around that. And so with Staticit, my goal is always to to hopefully expand a little bit beyond just the forms vision and become more of like a, a kind of back end as a service complement for um, newer static site technologies kind of being um, pushed ahead by Netlify and Vercel and some of these really innovative hosting companies. And one of the big questions in my mind from the from the get-go was, is this space mature enough? Is the Jamstack really mature enough where there's enough companies spending money on complementary tooling for sites built in this space? Or is it still pretty nascent? A lot of like, you know, engineers kind of playing with this new technology and eventually, you know, gaining adoption in um, in kind of commercial settings. And so I think I found it is, it is still decently young. There's still a, a major gap between, you know, kind of the turnkey, what you can, what you can build with like an older style CMS versus um, kind of Jamstack approach. And so, you know, with this one, I kind of found it was just, it was, it was a bit early, I think, to try to build a bootstrap business. Yeah. That's a tough part too, is if you're early to a space, are you too early? You know, what if you, what if you're yeah. two or three years early, even if Jamstack or right. static sites takes off, which it, you know, it seems to have traction. What if it's WordPress in 2004? four versus 2008, right. you know, cause there was an inflection right. point where it was like, man, if you were on the WordPress train, like Woo themes, that grew, hit it right at that right time. But if you, they had built Woo themes in 2004, 2005, it would have taken them six, seven years to hit that traction. And you were, I mean, yeah. you and I had a lot of conversations about this. We live in the same town and obviously, you know, chat about stuff and you were like, I just, I don't want to be doing that. You know, I don't want to be still at 10 K MRR in five or six years. Like that does not right. sound interesting, you know? Yeah. So yeah. let me, you have anything to add? Oh, and I was I just going to say, like, in, yeah, in addition to that, like, um, you know, one of the things we talk about is like, why, you know, why not just try to be early? And it's like, if you think about kind of market opportunity plotted on a timeline, like there exists a very narrow band of time where you can actually be early and, and catch that proverbial wave, right? And be kind of the one to swoop in and and gain dominance in the market. And then there's the rest of the timeline that's like, either the time before the market demand is high enough to build a business on and then the time where other competitors are already there right i mean especially yeah. in a healthy economy where where businesses naturally emerge to meet demand you know it's like it's just finding that time is almost like saying i'm going to go to 
I'm going to go to Hollywood and first become famous and then I will succeed. You know, it's like, right. It's, 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 it's a rare, there's, there's a little, moment. little too much luck in the be early for my taste personally. Yeah. I mean, obviously people yeah. do it, you know, again, I bring up Josh from bear metrics, uh, 80 with woo themes. He was early to the paid, yeah. you know, um, paid themes. And I had a bunch of examples in a talk I gave once. I can't remember the others, but there were yeah. people who, I mean, I even think of like opt-in monster and sumo, you know, the sumo, sumo me, I guess it was called at the time and, and drip, right. We were early to that space and got some traction. Um, and yeah, there's a little, it's not as repeatable as I, I like to make these things. Right. So another right. question that came in from Pablo is an interesting one. What products did you think of and abandon in your process of trying level static kit and savvy cow? And for folks who don't know level, was you were working on it a couple years ago and it was essentially a Slack competitor, a less interruptive Slack competitor. Static kit we've yeah. covered and of course Savvy Cal's which we're working on now, but what products yeah. did you think of Abandon? Well, that's a that's kind of a tough one to answer because I have, I like you, Rob, I have an idea notebook that it has just pages <laughs> upon pages of, you know, lots of random ideas from over the years and um, most of them probably not very good, right? So I didn't really make a, a deliberate run at too many other ideas aside from these. I would say one of the things I was vetting, I think, I think it was maybe a little bit before level and then after level, I kind of returned back to it was some like tooling for um, indie hackers or people in kind of the the earlier side of the microcom space. Like what could, could there exist a suite of tools that, you know, helps people get their business off the ground quicker with like basic email marketing, basic uh, landing pages and that kind of stuff. And um, so that was one I remember thinking about and ultimately didn't, didn't move forward with. And, and I think you were, there was at one point you were going to do something integrating with Stripe because you wanted to be where the money was. That's right. right? Yeah. And I don't remember yeah. specifics about it, but we definitely, yeah, it was actually, it was going to be something, something around, um, you kind of like what the Stripe customer portal serves now, like kind of a right. the ability to send send someone over to a page where they can update their credit card, change their plan, have like a an auto automatically like optimized for you checkout flow for signing up for a SaaS app and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, thankfully didn't enter that space because Stripe well, that, appears to be making some moves in that direction. That was one of the big reasons we talked about that. And we're like, man, this is a great idea. Man, you're going to get trucked by the platform risk yep. on this one. Stripe <laughs> yep. is going to move fast and they're going to build a good product and they're probably going to yeah. you know, accidentally uh, crush you there. Yep. So yep. I, I have a question now about Level and compared to Savvy Cal. Like Level was also in a competitive space. You know, you were entering a place where Slack owns it and then there are these Slack competitors already and you were entering it with and kind of trying to niche down almost or take a different angle and saying, look, yeah. we are going to provide the value of Slack, but less interruptive for, for makers and people who want to do deep work. But mm -hmm. you worked on it for a year, year and a half and, and didn't get traction and shut it down. So what's the difference there between you know, Level and, and Savvy Cal, I guess? Yeah. So I kind of made a small bulleted list of this and I have like a deep dive blog post on DerekRimer.com too, if people want to check that out. Um, but kind of the the big the big points are like one very extremely high switching costs, which is something that I just sort of underestimated um, how deeply ingrained Slack was to people's workflows, ranging from small companies all the way up to, of course, the larger you are, the more the more kind of it has its tentacles into your processes, um, and and with that requiring universal buy in from companies. So you know. There were usually in all the the kind of early customers that I spoke to, there were always a couple champions, obviously, who who believed that the Slack model for communication was not healthy. But there also usually existed a handful of people in the org who saw no no issue with it and were kind of a, a blocker to to changing up the the stack. And so, um, you know, that's that's another frustrating piece that I ran into. Um, I think it's it's difficult to pilot because it kind of requires required you to make a wholesale switch over. You know, splitting communication between two tools was kind of a nightmare, and a lot of people were really resistant to doing that. And um, another thing I heard was just like a lot of people wanted to continue using Slack if for no other reason than it's already installed on my computer and I'm in a bunch of Slack workspaces already. So they kind of had this weird network effect. Um, thing that that gave inertia to switching to something else. And so, you know, all those things combined made it an extremely 
difficult uphill battle. In contrast, you know, Savvy Cal, you can you can use it effectively in single player mode, you know, or you can use it as a team if you're like a customer success team or something or a sales team that needs to, to do group scheduling. Um, switching costs are decently low, even if you have, you know, 10 scheduling links, um, it's not that difficult to switch over. And that's, that's also on the flip side, a, a risk, like, if, if it's easy to switch to Savvy Cal, then potentially it's easy to switch away from it. So that'll be something that I'm going to be paying attention to is like, how can I make my product stickier than the products that people were leaving to come over to mine? Um, and then it also has kind of this, this nice little baked in virality piece too. And every time someone shares a Savvy Cal link, you know, more people are becoming aware of the product. So, so different in many, in many different aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. There is a question about growth channels. Have you found a growth channel that's working? Can you share what you did to find it? Hmm. And I mean, I think, you know, it's something we should have done at the top is have you tell people what, what stage are you at? Like, can you tell us how many customers yeah. you have or just something so they, so they do know at what phase, you know, seeking product market fit with X customers is probably a good way to put it, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I'm still pretty, pretty early days. I just actually launched officially. Um, Yay last week. Yahoo. So I have kind of, I'm still sharing numbers at this point. At some point, I'll probably dial that back, but I have about 35 customers right now and around $450 MRR. So it's, I feel good about where it's at. Obviously it's, it's, you know, have lots, lots of progress to make um, off of days. that, yeah. but, but it's early days. And I still see this as, you know, kind of in the, in like the lean startup sense, it's like still my, my learning machine. It's the, <laughs> it's my proving ground for figuring out what are those channels going to be. And, um, you know, I felt like launching was, was a, a big step towards, towards accelerating learning. Um, right. And so I will be, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the traction book from Gabriel Weinberg and Justin Maris and the bullseye framework in there. So, you know, that's kind of my go-to for, for sussing out what my traction channels are going to look like and what kind of experiments I'm going to run to figure that out. Um, so not quite, don't quite have all that figured out just yet for Savvy Cal, but that's yeah. probably where I'll work. So no, yeah. no growth channels yet, but you're basically in the process of, you know, finding market, finding product market fit, I think, finding yeah. a, you already have users who are going to use it and, you know, like the tiny seed team switched over and it's like, yeah, yeah. this does everything we need that Calendly did and there's yep. no reason why we would switch, you know, so I'm guessing that you're going to have, you know, a decent amount of people sticking around, but you're trying to get to that point where it's not, oh, I am I am on par or I have feature parity with Calendly. You know, you want right. to get to that point where it's like, oh, I need, like if you are this type of user, you need to yep. get on Savvy Cal, right? You need to yep. be on Superhuman and not using the Gmail web interface, right? And you need yep. to be using, you know, whatever email service provider, if, you know, if, if you really are in that space. So you're not, yep. I get the feeling you're not there yet, but do you have a process or is there something that you're doing specifically that that might be helpful to those who are also trying to trying to get there? Yeah. So, I mean, something I did, um, early on that gave me my first nice bump of information was, um, when I put up my landing page and I was collecting, you know, email addresses for people interested in the product. Um, I did a, a an autoresponder email right after they signed up that basically said, Hey, if you're interested in being kind of an early adopter of this tool, um, fill out this brief survey. And in it, I kind of asked, you know, what are you using today? I wanted to get an idea of like, at what point would it make sense to onboard these or invite these people to come onto the product um, based on how far I, my progress. Um, and then also kind of figured out like, are you in the market for a tool? And, and a chunk of people said like, nope, just curious, which is super helpful. And then the people who said yes, they usually then wrote a paragraph or two about what they're looking for and, and why the tools in the market today are not, are not satisfying their needs. And some of it aligned with, with hypotheses I had come up with and other things I had not, I not heard of before. So that was a, that was a really helpful, like early indicator of like these people, you know, went through a couple layers of friction, filling out a survey and to, to express to me, um, you know, the problems they had. And, and I think it was somewhere close to half of the people who joined the list, um, went through that, that phase of filling out the survey as well. So that was a, that was a pretty good indicator to me that there's, there's something here and people are, are particularly motivated, not just to see Kind of a new product but have like share their thoughts on what they'd like to see um in a new in a new tool yep yeah and that actually ties into the the next question it's from 
Jeremy Chase, he says, when entering a crowded market, how do you look for a niche that has opportunity? And I think one way I'll throw out while you're while you're thinking is, you know, with with if I were going to go into competitive space, I would look for a competitive space with a hated market leader. So if everyone yeah. bitches about Salesforce, I would ask myself, can I build either a niche? And that, this isn't even a niche. This is just a way to attack it. The niche is I'm not them. You know, when we Infusionsoft, yeah. people just did not like them. They were so overpriced and the software was shit. And so we built an easier to use, less expensive version of that. Um, but that's not the only way to do it. It's just an easy, you know, it's easy to get refugees at that point. You're, I don't, yeah. I don't feel like you're entering that space. I don't hear people saying I hate Calendly. It's not widely despised the way maybe QuickBooks is or was, you know, and, and I think PayPal yeah. at one point was. And, you know, there's certain companies that are kind of easy pickings, um, but yeah. you're not in that space, but you're looking at it from, from a different angle. So yeah, you want to give your take on this? Yeah, I think, I mean, there a lot of tools and Calendly being kind of the, the, the dominant player, I think, um, you know, is it's a simple tool. It does, it does its job decently well, but, um, and it's, I will say it's not hated. It's, it's pretty, it's a pretty well liked tool, but when you start digging a couple layers deeper, um, you know, you start scouring through forums, you start initiating conversations, um, you know, on, on Twitter and such, and you start to unearth some, some like, feature requests people have been asking for that have kind of fallen on deaf ears. Um, and I think that's just, you know, they, they, for better or worse, they have a pretty um, tight rein on scope of their product. And so I think, you know, it's it's like if you start listening to some of the more power user use cases, um, you will start to find <laughs> find some, some areas to explore. And now, granted, you have to be careful that you don't go, you know, um, too far. I mean, this was something we had to resist with drip early on. You know, we had, we had power users like Brennan Dunn and probably a lot of people know Brennan Dunn and, you know, Brennan's ideal tool probably is, you know, would only be usable by Brendan because it'd be too complicated, but, um, right. so you have to be careful with that. But I think that's what I'm starting to see is just like, um, kind of a, a, a list of wants and needs from people who want to take the tool a little bit further, um, uh, beyond yeah. kind of the simple, the simple dominant player. That's what I was going to say. This third kind of framework that I think about, because I gave one, you gave one, that the way I think about it is if I'm going to enter any space, a competitive space or otherwise, I'm going to say, and I want to niche down, I'm going to look at industries or roles within a company. So industries yeah. are things like, well, I'm going to build accounting software that caters to hairstyle yeah, or salons. You know, I'm not saying do that, yeah. but that, that's one example or accounting software for, um, you know, people that have u very unique accounting needs. Maybe it's for SaaS companies because they maybe right. they defer revenue and have annual this and that, and it's more complicated than just using zero. So you can go mm -hmm. industry verticals or you can go roles at a company because you'll often hear, well, Calendly works for me, but I'm like a salesperson and I would, would really use these five things to make sales better. Or Calendly works, but I'm I'm head of HR and I need this to be confidential. And, and once they submit this, I need it to go and like trigger this PDF to get sent and this workflow or whatever. You know, I mean, you can imagine a yep. role at any company across industry verticals because an mm -hmm. HR manager at Target, Best Buy, and General Mills probably has similar needs even though they're in different industries. So that's yep. just a third kind of way to, to think about it. And from there, I would you know use your approach, which is a lot of conversations. I'd probably be hitting people up on LinkedIn. I'd probably be on forums. I'd be watching Twitter. Mm -hmm. you know, I'd, have, I'd have Google alerts. I'd have, be in the Facebook groups for the, the tool or tools that I'm thinking about competing against. Yep. And I'd be looking at what are they not building? What are people complaining about? You know, any type of info and what are the commonalities and is it a role mm -hmm. or is it, you know, an industry vertical? Mm -hmm. So, yep. Cool. That's where we are. Well, sir, we are at time. It's been a great conversation. Um, it has. Thanks for, it's been fun. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. Your first time on MicroConf on air. Yeah. Good to be here. Folks want to keep up with you. You are at Derek Reimer on Twitter and DerekReimer.com. Is that right? Yep. You blog a little bit mm -hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, yep. for people who listen to podcasts, the Art of Product podcast comes out every Friday morning. Thursday. Is that right? <laughs> Thursday, is it? Yeah. I was thinking it was tomorrow <laughs> and today's Wednesday. All right. You're right. Thursday morning. Cool. Yes. Well, anyways, man, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, if you 
you have not checked out microconfremote.com, you can see the remote event, the virtual event we did a couple weeks ago and uh, purchase access to that for, I think it's $25 for four, four and a half hours of live streaming. Thank you so much to Derek Reimer for coming on the show today. I thought that was a really fun conversation. Thanks. Thank you for listening and asking those awesome questions. And also thanks to Hey.com and Stripe, who are headline partners for the year. Really appreciate their partnership with Microcom. That's it. See you again next week. Same time, same place.